Looks like we're good to go. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from today. Welcome to the first of the 2018 series of online learning sessions on humanitarian law and policy. And for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Unherid Lang. I'm the executive director of PHAP, the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection, and I will be serving today as your host and facilitator. It's great to see so many familiar names uh, online today, as well as a number of first-time participants. In this 60-minute session, we will look at the use and, in some cases, the misuse of language of international humanitarian law in situations of armed conflict, and how at the heart of this issue is often a challenge in recognizing the logic of this body of law. So now we will turn to the substance of today's session, the language and logic of international humanitarian law, IHL, common misconceptions, use, and misuse. Our speaker today is Dr. Theo Boutrouche, who joined PHAP just last year as our new humanitarian law and policy course director. Prior to joining PHAP, Theo worked with a variety of organizations in the field of IHL and international human rights law, including the International Commission of Jurists, Amnesty International, the Norwegian Refugee Council, Save the Children, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and a number of others. His work has taken him on legal research and fact-finding missions in conflict and post-conflict settings, including Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq, Georgia, DRC, Uganda, uh, Kenya, and elsewhere. The topic of today's session, uh, which as I mentioned is launching the 2018 series, was inspired um, not only by Teo's experiences to date interacting with many kinds of actors uh, on the ground in situations of armed conflict, uh, but also by a number of the questions and the discussions that have arisen uh, more recently in the PAP courses he's been facilitating in recent months. We've also uh, received examples and questions already from many of you as you were registering for the webinar, uh, and Teo has incorporated a number of these into his presentation. So uh, thanks so much to all of you who submitted um, uh, those great examples and questions already. Uh, following the presentation, we'll have some time for more Q&A, so do submit any additional questions that come to mind uh, as he speaks. So with that, Teo, I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you, Anna Red. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, addressing all of you with this uh, with this topic today. Um, as Anna Red uh, mentioned, uh, this is not a topic that PAP came up with uh, on its own, but it's uh, it's a recurring overlapping issue we uh, we observed uh, during PAP training, and uh, or I also witnessed that in my own experience. And I think this is um, this is an interesting way of starting the webinar season for PAP uh, to look at, um, at this issue of language and logic of IHL and how it's being used, misused, uh, most of the time misused uh, unintentionally, I would say, uh, but also the impact of this uh, on humanitarian work and um, on uh, negotiation in particular uh, in the context of armed conflict. I will be uh, looking at various issues as you may have understood from the summary of this webinar, uh, and we'll have time for, for questions later. For, for this kind of 20, 20, 25 minutes presentation, I'd like to focus on uh, three, main, uh, three main issue. Uh, first, we'll uh, look at an overview of some of the way IHL language is being used. I think it's important to, uh, to bear in mind that, uh, of course, uh, some organizations or actors will be using IHL more explicitly as part of their mandate, as opposed to uh, others who would um, not uh, be looking at those issues from a strict legal perspective. And I think that's one of the, the interests of, of today's, uh, today's session. Um, but then I want to also turn to some ways in which IHL language or terms are being, are being misused. Uh, and I think it uh, provides some, uh, some example of some of the challenges you face uh, as uh, practitioners in the field or um, even in headquarters. And then we look at uh, maybe something that is at the heart of uh, this issue about the language of IHL might be about some misunderstanding regarding the logic uh, of IHL itself. And I think understanding this logic better um, might help only, of course, in certain um, cases 
to maybe address an issue uh, with more tools or more effectiveness. Uh, from the outset, uh, I should point out that um, this session is not about uh, something that has been coined as lawfare, meaning a kind of pattern of uh, misuse or manipulation of the law to achieve political or military goals. Now, of course, uh, misusing IHL might be done for uh, all kinds of, of purposes in a deliberate manner and in a systematic manner, but this is not, uh, this is not the, the central uh, point of, of today's session. But I should point out that IHL itself contains uh, norms with regard to abuse of the law, if you consider the prohibition of conducting warfare uh, using perfidy uh, or the prohibition of uh, human shield. These are norms, uh, well-recognized norms of IHL that are specifically about trying to abuse uh, certain um, protection of norms uh, within within IHL. Now, turning to um, the, the first um, set of, of issues I wanted to look at, um, with regard to an overview of some of the way um, IHL is being used. Um, of course, this is really a snapshot and you may have various different ways of using IHL, but the most common one would be, for example, uh, when an organization or an actor is reporting or speaking out on IHL violation after having done so. Those, those findings using, uh, using legal notions. But of course, something that using IHL to have a legal basis to negotiate or to engage in a, in a discussion with one of the parties of the conflict, or using IHL as part of uh, a set of arguments to advance uh, your, uh, your point or your position. And of course, something that is, that is common to many organizations is reference, general reference to IHL uh, when reminding the parties to a conflict of their, uh, of their obligation, either uh, as part of a, of a statement um, on a specific incident or uh, in general as, as, um, as a reminder uh, as part of any, any type of activities being carried out. Now, of course, as I said, um, the reference or the use of IHL will, will vary from one actor to another. And this session is not about calling for all actors in armed conflict uh, to know IHL or to become expert in IHL. But this is more about showing that having a certain awareness of how IHL terms carry a certain meaning uh, can actually help in whatever work or mandate you're trying to uh, achieve um, in, in your respective area of intervention. And of course, uh, this is also uh, very clear from my own experience that sometimes reference to IHL might be counterproductive. So knowing what IHL is about might also help you determine that sometimes it's not helpful to refer to IHL. For example, if the, your interlocutor uh, is contested the very ex contesting the very existence of an armed conflict. If you start referring to IHL terms, this might actually shift the discussion to um, to an old point, a whole different point of uh, arguing whether or not there is an armed conflict uh, with regard to the, the, the situation where you're operating. Now, one of the reasons um, I think this, this the topic of today is, is so uh, commonly relevant for, uh, for many of you is that IHL terms refer to many terms that are being used also in a more and in a way we are going to be speaking different language at the same time the moment we use a particular term that might uh, not be for you a legal term but that actually is a very specific uh, IHL notion. Take for example the term combatant. Combatant is a generic term uh, that you can use to describe anyone fighting in the context of an armed conflict. But under international humanitarian law, this is, this is a notion that um, requires certain condition to be met for someone to be qualified as a combatant, because from that derives the, uh, the status of prisoner of war in case this person qualifies as a combatant is 
he's captured non-combatant as well. It can be used in a general sense, but it's also uh, it's also a term that you find in IHL. I mean, the most common one I would say would be civilian. Civilian is being used by all kind of organizations uh, in the context of work um, in a situation of an armed conflict. Um, but depending on the actor, this might mean very different things. But under IHL, this is a key term as well uh, that is governed by a lot of, of norms uh, with a specific scope of application. Now, the, the terms innocent civilians also sometimes um, used, and I, I would just say this at this point, um, this would be an example where, of course, innocent civilian in the context of for communication or media purposes can be an appealing term, uh, but at the same time, uh, associating the term innocent to a civilian might be very misleading uh, if uh, you refer back to, uh, to IHL, and we might come back to that uh, in the context of the, um, the question session. Other terms um, that are um, commonly used, uh, and I think we, we got a lot of questions around this uh, for the before, before the seminar, uh, our question around protection. Well, actually, in IHL, the, the term protected person is a legal, very specific technical notion, uh, and not any person would be pro a protected person in the legal sense of the term. Um, so sometimes just using uh, this expression might uh, lead to confusion differing the, depending on who you are, you're talking to. Same with protection of civilians. If you talk to a UN peacekeeping force commander of what protection of civilian means, uh, that would be that might be completely different from one context to another, um, and even from one commander to another. Um, but if the term protection has to do with um, working to ensure the respect of the rights of, of individuals in accordance with uh, the relevant norms, IHL being the, the primary set of norms applicable in an armed conflict, uh, of course, any protection activity would require some form or degree of reference to, to IHL, maybe not at the operational level, but maybe at the pro programmatic level to consider this set of norms um, because this is at the essence, in the essence of the definition of protection, at least one of the commonly uh, recognized definition of protection. And finally, uh, for another um, set of, of terms that might be um, uh, challenging to use because they might have a, a specific meaning in IHL, but they might be used in very different ways, uh, depending on the actor concern, uh, this has to do with qualifying an attack. Someone can talk about uh, an unlawful, unlawful attack, which would be a, in violation of uh, international norms, for example. Uh, some would speak about an indiscriminate attack, a disproportionate attack, a direct attack. These are very specific terms under international humanitarian law. And from my experience, each time there is a reference to uh, those, uh, those expressions, uh, there are at least some level of confusion in the way they are, being, they are being used in the context of an armed conflict. And by the way, the term attack itself is defined in a very specific way under international humanitarian law. Now, moving to um, kind of overview of some of the misuse of, of IHL terms, this, as I said, this can be done in a deliberate way, in the sense that a party to a conflict might actually interpret an IHL term in a very broad way to justify a controversial conduct. So here, the use of IHL or misuse of IHL would be done for a certain purpose, um, but another, um, another way where you might have a deliberate misuse of IHL is to qualify an act as a violation of IHL just for the sake of being on the right side of the law and to attract attention and gain some moral high ground. Uh, but most of the misuse of IHL, I would say, are unintentional. Either, as I, we said, confla conflating an IHL term with uh, a non-legal term, um, or sometimes uh, referring to um, a general reference to IHL, uh, leading to some misunderstanding. Uh, just for the sake of this webinar, I chose a few uh, examples of those. Um, the first one, as you can see, uh, is in, in a report of an NGO. Um, and this is not about qualifying conduct. This is about summarizing the conduct of Lebanon 
in Israel in a way which might be problematic in strict IHL terms. You say that uh, Israeli army uh, says it is trying to minimize attacks on innocent civilians. This could be interpreted as limiting the number of direct attack against civilians. And I would assume that's not what uh, the Israeli army was, was claiming. But again, this reference to innocent civilian might then shift your discussion on saying, oh, but it means there are also uh, civilians who are not innocent. And then you move from a term that is very well defined in international humanitarian law to a discussion on innocence or guilt of a civilian, where then it's not a legal uh, distinction anymore. And this can lead to some um, potentially dangerous discussion or consequences uh, when it comes to, uh, to protection of those civilians. Another example, um, and again, this is the title of uh, a UN agency press release, but this might also be misleading, even if the, the press release itself might be clearer. If the title with regard to, uh, to uh, Libya's conduct uh, in Misrata is indiscriminate attacks on civilians, this might conflate attacks that are carried out in a way uh, that cannot distinguish between combatants and civilians uh, with attacks that are deliberately targeting civilians. And these are two different aspects when it comes to protection of civilians and conduct of hostilities uh, that might be at the heart of uh, the debate on the legality of those very attacks. Uh, and finally, with regard to this uh, case where there is a general reference to IHL, um, regarding a statement by a UN official uh, on attacks on health services and staff in northern Syria, UN, at the end of, of this statement, called on all parties to the conflict to take all measures to protect civilians, particularly in adhering to IHL and human rights law, including the prohibition of launching indiscriminate attacks and the principles of proportionality and precaution. Now, this in itself uh, could be an accurate restatement of some of the norms of IHL, but depending on the case at end, here uh, attacks on health services, if you end your statement by uh, a general reference like this, this might mean that you are not considering uh, those, um, those incidents as potentially deliberate direct attack against, um, against medical facilities and staff which could again be at the very heart of the of the issue of the legality of those attacks. Moving on now to uh, to uh, just some of the risks associated with with those misuse of IHL. Of course, this is an issue of of credibility. Um, this is an issue of legitimacy and uh, as well uh, of effectiveness. Um, one can consider that uh, the moment you either if, it, if it's in your mandate or not, uh, the moment you start making some confusing references to IHL, uh, then this can affect either your legitimacy because um, some actors on the ground can say this is not uh, your role to do that, or you are actually complicating our, our work uh, when we do uh, and we have to uh, apply and refer to IHL. But it's also the parties to the conflict that can use that uh, against uh, you and, and shift the discussion um, to, um, to a debate that is actually not at the core of, of your activity or your work. Now, as I said, it's not to say that um, there is a general misunderstanding of, of the logic of IHL, but sometimes uh, when, when it comes to dealing with IHL, some IHL is um, in a way um, confusing or too permissive. Um, or might think that IHL would provide very clear-cut answers, um, or might be dangerous because uh, IHL is actually drafted or crafted in terms that are taking into account uh, military consideration. But I think a, a better understanding of the very logic of IHL can help navigate those maybe uncomfortable uh, position when it comes to dealing with IHL in the first place. General common way of, uh, of describing IHL is to say that this set of norms is striking a balance between military necessity on one side and humanitarian imperatives on the other side. This um, 
being done to humanize or limit uh, the effects of of warfare. Now, misconceptions about this logic uh, revolve around IHL being too permissive in the sense that, um, for example, the moment you consider that IHL is applicable, uh, this can mean that with regard to the use of force, the moment uh, uh, a person or an object uh, qualify as a legitimate military target under IHL, there is much less restriction on the use of lethal force as opposed to, to human rights law. Um, or to say that it's very technical and that you should stay away from, from this set of norms. Or, in a way, it's dangerous because it's vague and open to interpretation. So the moment you move the discussion from political, moral, humanitarian arguments to legal arguments, you might open a Pandora box because some of those norms uh, are controversial and are interpreted different way. Uh, and in that sense, that might complicate your uh, negotiating position. But one has to understand that within IHL, military necessity is a legal term. Military necessity uh, is not about serving the military strategic or tactical interest of the party to the conflict. So by referring to IHL, this allows you to make sure that some of the military arguments used by parties to the conflict cannot be used in an arbitrary um, and unlimited way. So moving the discussion to IHL in certain contexts might actually uh, be very useful because military necessity does not work as a general exception to justify a violation of IHL. So the moment you are aware of that, um, you can actually um, use some of those IHL norms to maybe make an argument uh, and say, this party to the conflict cannot invoke military uh, interest because, for example, the norm, uh, the IHL norm, uh, which is being applicable there, um, does not uh, integrate a military necessity at all. Um, so I think this is important to uh, remember that military, military necessity can be invoked only if it is provided in the norm itself. So for some issues, that might be, uh, that might be a, a key aspect of the discussion to limit um, the conduct of, uh, of the parties to the conflict. Now, on that basis, uh, then I wouldn't say you get a, a kind of magic formula to solve all the problems you may find uh, on the ground uh, in your daily work. But at least if you refer to IHL, that is a, a set of norms uh, taking into account military consideration, you might find a common um, a common language uh, depending on who you're talking to, and you can shape some of the military uh, argument um, and make sure that they are being uh, they are being discussed within the framework uh, of uh, of IHL. So I just uh, refer here uh, on this uh, on this slide to some of um, Now, just to recap, and this I'm, I'm aware that this is only touching very briefly on some of the many more issues uh, that this, the title of this webinar uh, uh, entails. Um, but the whole point of uh, of this um, of this kind of introduction was to um, first highlight the fact that the logic of IHL uh, balancing military interest and humanitarian consideration might actually be um, uh, a useful tool uh, depending on the issue uh, you're facing uh, to actually engage in a conversation that other type of argument being political, economic, uh, moral or humanitarian might uh, might not be able to, uh, to achieve. Um, make sure that uh, when you use IHR language, uh, this is done in a more or less accurate way uh, to make sure that it does not uh, undermine your credibility, legitimacy, or effectiveness, and um, see, uh, and we can come back to that during the, the session of questions, see how, with regard to specific norms, this can be actually uh, making your life easier uh, to use some of those IHL terms or IHL language to uh, advance a particular 
protection uh, protection agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Teo. Uh, we're going to pull up the answers that came in uh, on those polls, so we can all take a look at those now and uh, see see how the results were. So, um, so first of all, the question regarding terms that you're frequently encountering in your work, uh, it looks like many of these uh, were encountered really often, but particularly protection um, is standing out. Uh, we also saw a lot of people uh, experiencing some of these um, uh, situations that you described, uh, Teo, regarding the use of IHL, uh, abusive use or misuse in different ways, but again, really standing out uh, here uh, was the problem of vague references to IHL, uh, which can be misleading, and I suppose this could be either uh, purposeful or not. But, but Teo, um, perhaps before we jump into the Q&A, do you have any reflections uh, on the results of the, of the polls that we see here? Well, uh, thank you. Um, well, I mean, this is this is reassuring in a way um, that um, uh, with regard to uh, to the terms or um, the the way uh, the IHL is being used, kind of confirming some of of those um, assumptions or um, ideas we had on uh, the most common um, kind of practices, I would say, when it comes to use and misuse. Um, and I mean, unsurprisingly, uh, protection uh, is um, the the term coming up a lot. And I think um, it's interesting because I mean, from my own experience, I I got into all kind of debates um, that actually originated from a misunderstanding of what protection means. And of course, protection, if you consider uh, forced early marriage in a refugee camp, which can be, which is a protection issue. There is no, um, I mean, there's no controversy about that. I think the issue when it comes to protection is depending on the mandate um, uh, of of the organization and depending who you're talking to. If there is a different understanding of what protection is, this can lead to um, to actions that are uh, actually uh, causing harm. I mean. From my own experience, I can remember uh, different um, definition of what protection of civilians means for a UN peacekeeping force commander, um, where from a pure, purely humanitarian point of view, not IHL point of view, but humanitarian point of view, uh, all situation referred by this commander were protection of civilians issue, but because of the fact that this UN peacekeeping uh, force was cooperating with the governmental army uh, on joint military operations when it came to the army uh, the governmental army entering a village um, this was not considered as raising an issue when it comes to the protection of civilians mandate of the un force whereas actually uh, in this particular country the governmental army was seen as the actor violating uh, the most uh, international norms when it comes to the protection of civilians, but I would um, at, at this stage I would uh, I would now turn back to uh, to the, the any question that the participant may have. Excellent. So yes, we've had a number of questions come in. I'm going to begin with one uh, submitted by Valentina in Lebanon. So Valentina is uh, sharing that in some situations in her experience it can be problematic to use the language of IHL as the parties to the conflict are even contesting the existence of an armed conflict in, a, in the first place and therefore contesting uh, the applicability of IHL in the first place. Are there cases when we could perhaps refer to other norms of international law beyond IHL to achieve the same aims or would this affect our legitimacy or credibility if we don't use IHL terms in the situation where we believe that they're applicable, but perhaps some parties don't. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Valentina, for this question. Uh, well, actually, it's um, it's a very good point in the sense that um, I mean, my whole kind of message behind this this introduction was not to say that uh, that IHL must be uh, the point of reference in all cases. I mean, if you consider the the, the case you're you're looking at where um, where the very existence, the very application of IHL uh, is contested, of course, referring explicitly to IHL will will be very counterproductive 
Now, there are ways, depending on the issue you're looking at, to either, without using IHL terms, in a way, uh, convey the same message, but not using, uh, using legal terms. But of course, if this is contested, and um, if you consider uh, the application of human rights law, um, that continues to apply during an armed conflict, but of course that uh, is uh, also applicable in, in peacetime. Those two body of norms, depending on the issue you're looking at, are basically uh, pursuing the same goal in terms of protection of um, of a human being. And um, of course, it's crafted in terms of rights when it comes to human rights, whereas for IHL, it's, it's not a question of rights, it's um, more the obligations uh, of of the parties to a, to a conflict. But I would say, in terms of knowing the context in which you're operating, if you already know that the existence of the armed conflict is controversial, uh, that would be my first example where I would say reference to IHL would be very, uh, very dangerous, uh, because this uh, would then drag the discussion in, in, a, in a direction which which then you will be only discussing about the existence or not of the armed conflict, uh, and you will not be addressing the substantial substantial issue uh, you you want to uh, to address. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so we've had um, an example uh, that's been raised by a participant in the event today, um, tuning in from Mali, uh, working with an INGO in Mali, and bringing up uh, an example of. Um, uh, practical security problem. Uh, so describing that, I believe it was just this week, uh, there's been a blanket restriction uh, put in place on movements by motorbike and pickup, uh, pickup trucks in a significant part of the country, with anyone using these modes of transport being considered uh, so-called military targets. Um, considering the use of this term military target, does, this raises the question, is this a uh, a practical security challenge uh, in which this INGO or others working uh, in the country could potentially use uh, IHL-based uh, arguments to to help uh, in this situation. Over to you. Thank you. I mean, this this is a this is a very interesting question because this this comes from a, a very practical uh, challenge on the ground. Now, uh, there would be different ways of going about um, about this issue. Um, I mean, of course raising concern when it comes to the security uh, of your own staff, but also security of civilians uh, by um, assuming that any uh, pickup or any uh, motorbike is a military target would be uh, maybe the first line of argument. But when it comes to IHL, that's where maybe a reference to IHL could be useful in the sense that you could, and I would say you should, address the issue by trying to um, talk to uh, one of the high-ranking officials within the army uh, to point to the fact that uh, they have obligation under IHL and that one of these obligation has to do with um, considering that military objectives are only are defined in a very limited way under international humanitarian law and that you cannot uh, from the outset assume that any such vehicle would be a legitimate military target, then having this discussion at uh, the level of soldiers in the street might not be uh, helpful, but bringing it to uh, the hierarchy uh, of the military, uh, assuming that they've been trained on IHL, uh, could actually, that would be a valuable argument to bring, uh, bring IHL into the discussion because you already know that your interlocutor in that context would be sensitive to that type of argument, whereas if you were bringing that argument to another, um, maybe to the to the chief of a, of a military base, this might not be helpful. Um, but getting into a discussion saying that under IHL, military objectives are defined in a strict way and that uh, motorcycle and um, motorbikes and pickups are um, civilian objects and and cannot be assumed to be military target uh, would be a would be a sensible sensible way of addressing that issue okay, excellent thanks uh, we 
have uh, now a question from Elisabetta, who's working in Syria. Uh, Elisabetta is pointing to several terms um, that, uh, as far as she uh, can tell, seem to be used in different ways. She's pointing to the term human shields, uh, forced displacement, collective punishment. I saw in the uh, poll results from our other participants, uh, these were also uh, terms of concern uh, to a number of other people in the in the virtual room as well. Um, is is uh, is Elisabetta correct in her observation that these are being used in different ways? And what what are the implications? What are your views on that, Theo? Uh, thank you. I mean, again, this is this is typically a situation where, um, as a way to um, describe an issue you observe on the ground in the field, uh, for example, uh, civilian being close to uh, a military target or um, certain type of conduct that you could describe in very general terms as collective uh, collective punishment or uh, movement of population described in commonly as forced displacement by doing that you would actually be using um, very uh, very legal and I would almost say technical terms under international humanitarian law now this is not to say that those situations might not qualify as collective punishment or case of human shields or um, a case of, um, remember the third one. Um, collective punishment. Collective punishment. Um, but depending on the situation, or forced displacement, yes. Um, depending on the situation, using those those terms might actually get you into trouble if for example you're describing um just the movement of population fleeing the hostilities as forced displacement why because forced displacement uh, the prohibition to order force uh, to order displacement um is uh, a particular norm under ihl and can even amount to a war crime depending on the circumstances so the moment you start using those apparently generic terms um, that also carry a very specific legal meaning under IHR, this can then um, again in a way affect your um, your um, your credibility the same with collective punishment it's not to say that any measure carried out in relation to an armed conflict is collective punishment uh, i think one of the questions was asked when it comes to uh, uh, cutting the funding to UNRWA uh, being labeled as collective punishment. I see the appealing in referring to that terminology uh, to attract attention, but legally speaking, collective, we are talking about collective punishment when you have a measure uh, adopted by one of the parties to the conflict to punish a member of a group for an offense in response to an offense uh, committed by another member of that group um, so in that case although you were motivated by the very noble uh, i would say uh, aim to uh, bring attention or highlight an issue by qualifying this situation as collective punishment then you can be criticized for that and then can this can lead to a complete different debate than getting you away from uh, the very reason why you made that statement in the first place Great, thanks. Um, our next question is from Anne. She's based in Israel and she's asking, um, well, she's pointing out uh, that a lot of the terms that are coming up, a lot of what we're talking about here has to do with how to describe uh, the effects of an attack. Uh, so how can the effects of an attack be properly described, taking into account the logic of IHL, uh, as you say, and the need to consider and balance uh, military necessity versus humanitarian imperatives. Uh, thank you. Well, again, this is describing the effects of an attack depending on, on your mandate or the organization you're working for can be done for various purposes. Then the question is, um, if you're describing the effects of that attacks and you just want to highlight um, the humanitarian consequences of that attack, and this is not about discussing or assessing the legality uh, under international humanitarian law of that very attack. Of course, you may want to, or especially if if this um, this attack, you don't have all the information when it comes to uh, the elements of that attacks to make that determination, uh, focusing on 
in general terms on human humanitarian consequences of that attack might be more helpful because the moment you move away from that to a legal discussion under IHL, then comes into play um, all kind of even almost technicalities when it comes to uh, what is, for example, an indiscriminate attack and within indiscriminate attack, what is uh, what we call a disproportionate attack. And to come up with that type of determination, this might require you to have uh, collected information on various aspects of that attack, comparing uh, the effect of that attack on civilians with the military, the anticipated military advantage at the time of the attack um, from the attacker's po point of view. Um, and you might not have all the information to come up with uh, with that uh, that type of, of finding or, or conclusion. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question that's uh, just come in from Christian in Australia. Um, I'll, I'll just read the whole thing uh, out to you here. Teo, he writes, in terms of the Syrian conflict, opposite sides of the conflict are giving a very different account of IHL violations on either side. This is being reflected with various degrees of bias on all sides of the conflict. How can the maintenance of IHL compliance be raised in such situations where there is limited objective account of belligerent activity and where reporting is widely interpreted with bias for varying political reasons? I guess maybe a, a, a reinterpretation or a follow-up question uh, could be uh, related to where, where do you turn uh, for it? maybe an objective account of, um, of IHL uh, violations uh, or alleged violations uh, in a situation of armed conflict. Over to you. Thank you. Well, I mean, you refer to the, the case of Syria, but I would, I would say that this context of mutual accusation of IHL violation, this is very much a characteristic or a feature of any type of armed conflict. I mean, if you consider the conflict between Georgia and Russia uh, in 2008, uh, the conflict lasted five days, the actual uh, hostilities. Um, but in terms of mutual accusation of IHL and human rights violation, uh, this um, exchange of, accu of, mutu of accusation lasted m much more than five days. Um, now, moving from that lack of trust and mutual accusation to um, having an objective account, and I would say of two things. First, of the facts related to those accusations, uh, making the difference with allegations and with facts and um, incident that actually occurred. Uh, that's one thing. And this, of course, as you pointed out, must be done objectively and in a credible manner. And I would say um, at the heart of this is not only who is uh, who will be doing that, that fact-finding work, uh, but also on the basis of which of which methodology, because you you might actually have a very impartial uh, and credible actor doing it, but if that actor for that very issue is not using a credible methodology, um, then it's not the reputation of the actor which will bring credibility to the finding. It's the very fact that this actor cannot explain how um, it established. Uh, the facts in relation to those to those allegations. The other part of of the issue is moving from establishing the facts to uh, making a legal determination, and and there you might also have um, issues when it comes to objectivity, in the sense that someone could qualify a set of facts as a violation of IHL, whereas somebody else might uh, might not depending on uh, the way the, the relevant IHL norms will be, um, will be interpreted. But I mean, beyond Syria, I would say um, the, whole, the whole challenge here is, is of course, to access uh, credible and reliable information and to make those determination. But I would say in, in, a, in a context where you have so many actual uh, violation of IHL happening and uh, on top of that, uh, mutual allegations that are also uh, co that are controversial. Um, this is actually critical to have uh, some actors, such as, for example, the the UN uh, Commission of Inquiry on Syria, uh, looking at it through solid and strong 
fact-finding methodology to, um, to clarify what violations actually occurred with allegations that are actually purely, purely allegations and are, are not verified. Okay, thanks. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, we, have, we have a question that came in from Yao, who's based in Switzerland. Um, and uh, he is, um, well, I think getting to the, to the idea that armed actors, whether state or non-state actors, uh, may be using terminology or uh, definitions or language uh, that are not the same as would come naturally to humanitarian actors, but asking, should humanitarian actors stick to the terminology or the definitions that are being used by these armed actors, or are there risks involved? in that? What are the advantages or risks of using, of mimicking, using the same language, using the same definitions that armed actors are using um, as a humanitarian actor? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, actually, it's, it's, um, it's a very interesting uh, uh, case where even if you're not an expert or you have a very limited knowledge about IHL, um, and that one of uh, the armed actor involved in the conflict come up with a definition, a reference to IHL, uh, you shall not take this at face value, uh, that's for sure. I would say the moment an actor is making a direct or indirect reference to, uh, to IHL or to a definition, um, this is not about taking that definition uh, as such and just accept it, but actually referring to IHL and looking at what actually IHL actually says on that might be a good way to counter uh, that, uh, that definition of that argument in the sense that if an actor is somehow interpreting a notion in a very broad way, by referring back to IHL, you have a kind of common objective framework you can rely on um, in terms of, of, of obligations and norms. Um, telling you that maybe this actor uh, would insist on a, on a very military expansive definition of what is a military objective, you could counter that by relying on IHL, still highlighting the military considerations, and in that sense, speak somehow the same language as this armed actor, but you would be referring to IHL norms that are recognized and commonly uh, applied uh, by uh, by all actors, um, and this could help you to actually convince that uh, armed actor that even if IHL is taking into account military consideration, uh, the way this actor is using uh, or defining this military objective is too broad. And actually, on top of that, you can use a practical argument saying if you start doing that, the other side would apply the same definition, broad definition of military objective, and we'll end up targeting objects or person which are not related to, uh, to your military. Excellent. Thanks so much. We are uh, rapidly running out of time. So, Teo, I will ask uh, if you'd like to take a couple of minutes to share any closing thoughts with the participants today. And then uh, afterwards, I'll just get into some closing remarks of my own highlighting upcoming events. So over to you for, uh, say, two, three minutes if you have uh, any, any closing thoughts. Uh, thank you very much. Although this, um, this whole topic um, uh, would uh, would require maybe even face-to-face -face, uh, discussion. Um, uh, I I would like to conclude on maybe highlighting another um, another uh, uh, critical issue that many you mentioned uh, find on the ground, and that might actually um, be an issue where references to IHL might help. Uh, I would say not find a definitive solution to that issue, but reminding the importance of IHL uh, in that context uh, is, is key. And this has to do with, with uh, uh, attacks on medical facilities and medical personnel. It's true that um, in this case, uh, of course, targeting of, of medical facilities and, uh, and staff uh, might be uh, might be discussed or criticized or condemned um, in very general terms and not legal terms. But it's interesting to uh, to remind that IHL uh, has very detailed norms with regard to the protection and respect 
of medical staff and medical facilities and that some of those arguments used by some parties to the conflict such as uh, oh but medical facilities uh, are uh, harboring combatants uh, or that uh, there are some armed guards uh, around this hospital um, and this is why we are targeting that hospital uh, all those arguments military arguments or practical arguments that can be put forward by by a party to a conflict are addressed uh, and are actually very clearly uh, governed by IHL in the sense that uh, all those cases of uh, enemy uh, fighters uh, being uh, taken care of in those medical facilities, the presence of light ammunition uh, in those hospitals or the fact that uh, ammunition were removed from injured uh, combatants in that hospital, all these situations are addressed in IHL in the sense that the IHL is clear uh, clearly stating that those cases do not make hospital become military legitimate target and I think it's it's important for those very very burning issue and challenges fa uh, humanitarian face on the ground to go deeper into IHL norms to be able to uh, to see that IHL actually um, offers for certain issue uh, an additional tool or language of argumentation that can at times be more per persuasive than uh, other type of arguments. Thank you. And thank you, Theo, uh, for the session today. It's been very helpful and a great way, uh, I think, to, to launch the series. Um, speaking of which, we've really had to hold ourselves back because we have a limited amount of time and so many of the questions that have been inspired by the discussion today are really going uh, into some deep, uh, uh, deep questions and important uh, content areas that we'll be uh, raising in future sessions, not only in this online series, but also uh, in our ex extensive uh, series of face-to-face -face courses on humanitarian law and policy that are scheduled for the coming year. Um, so I do hope that uh, you'll all come and join us again uh, for the sessions that are coming up where we'll get into um, some of the uh, the deeper uh, questions and some of the substantive uh, uh, issues that are being raised um, by all of your experiences um, uh, and the questions that have come up today. <clears throat> for this session, um, I'd like to let you know that the audio and video recordings that were, and the mentioned resources will be available in the next few days on the event page and we will uh, let you know by email about this when they are ready. And then I'll just highlight um, our next session in this series and in doing so I uh, would like to announce, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, Teo will actually be taking over in the host role, so I get to retire um, from at least this uh, this aspect of the work on the humanitarian law and policy side, and very happy to hand over the reins to Teo, who will be hosting the rest of the series this year. The next event in the series, uh, we'll be looking at the issue of the uh, or the question of the attack in December 2017 on UN peacekeepers in North Kivu in DRC. Um, Teo and his uh, guest expert will be analyzing the status of UN peacekeepers under IHL using this particular case study. You can already register for that event. It's taking place next month on the 27th of March. Um, you can also read more about the session on the event page. Uh, then moving outside of the track of humanitarian law, also happy to announce a new series of online events in partnership with ICVA. After our learning streams, um, uh, the ICVA learning streams that we've collaborated on over the past year on humanitarian financing and coordination, this new series will focus on the humanitarian development peace nexus. The first session will take place on the 12th of April, introducing the concept of the so-called triple nexus and how nexus thinking is influencing policy discussions at the local, country, and global level. And again, you can already register for that one, clicking the link on your screen. Then again, as mentioned, we have now announced the 2018 schedule for our PDP courses, the Professional Development Program courses on humanitarian law and policy. Uh, for those of you who are, who are not familiar yet with this face-to-face -face series, each thematic workshop um, is different in each location. They focus 
focus on different issues of concern to humanitarian actors. This year, uh, the series includes workshops on humanitarian access, on human rights and armed conflict, protection of civilians during the conduct of hostilities. And in that workshop, actually, we're going to be looking uh, very specifically, um, for example, at the issue of protection of medical personnel and facilities. I saw someone suggesting that in the chat. So uh, we're on it this year, um, and that may be indeed an area of expansion in the future. Other workshops coming up will look at multinational operations, uh, engagement with armed non-state actors, and more. You can learn more about these by uh, clicking on the link that Liz has put up on the screen. Last but not least, we're also launching in 2018 a new professional development program training track on displacement, forced migration, and international law. This also consists of a core training on refugees, IDPs, and forced migrants, protection in law and practice, as well as a series of issues roundtables on displacement, forced migration, and international law. The first sessions will take place in Geneva, then later in the year in Kampala, and in Amman. Um, and we've had uh, a great response so far. A number of people already registered. I hope some of you uh, will also consider joining those sessions um, if you're able. So with that, uh, we'll be signing off. Thank you so much for your active involvement and the very interesting discussions, um, the questions and examples that have been brought up. Thanks to Teo for his insights on the issue and for opening the season of webinars. Mm, I'd invite all of the participants also so before you leave to fill in the survey so that you can give us our feedback and we can take that, of course, into account in the design of all the future sessions. So with that, I'll wish you a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, and look forward to speaking to you again soon.